Up next on Art Rocks, the legacy of playwright Lorraine Hansberry, inspiring actors old and young in Baton Rouge. I think it's incredibly important to know who Lorraine Hansberry is. First of all, she introduced us to the world of black theater, as I like to call it, theater of the black experience. And I think she introduced us to the black family. A contemporary artist finds her niche in glass. Art to me is adherence to a form. And raising a glass with the owners of Landry Vineyards, a homegrown Louisiana winery crafting venerable vintages in the hill country of West Monroe. That's all coming up next on Art Rocks. Like the impulse that drives an artist's creativity, Georgia Pacific's 850 Louisiana employees are driven to produce quality paper products for your home and business. Georgia Pacific is proud to support LPB and Art Rocks. And by Lamar Advertising Company, proud to support the arts and Art Rocks. Headquartered in Baton Rouge, Lamar's 461 Louisiana employees have been helping brands and businesses reach their customers creatively for over 100 years. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thanks for joining us on Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads magazine. It's exciting times for fans of playwright Lorraine Hansberry, creator of the iconic play A Raisin in the Sun. PBS recently aired the American Masters documentary about Hansberry entitled Sighted Eyes, Feeling Heart. LPB was one of just four local stations nationwide to receive special funding from WNET-TV in New York to expand our coverage of the prolific playwright. Child, when do you think is the time to love somebody the most? When they done good and made things easy for everybody? Well then, you ain't through learning. Because that ain't the time at all. It's when he's at his lowest and can't believe in himself because the world done whipped him so. Talking about life, mama. You always telling me to look at life like it is. Well, I laid up there and I figured it out. Life, just like it is. Who gets and who don't gets. It's all divided up, mama. Life is, sure enough between the takers and the tookin. I finally figured it out. Yeah, some of us are always getting tookin. Those are lines from Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun. Students at Baton Rouge Community College joined others from the capital city to spend a week immersing themselves in Hansberry's work. New Venture Theatre hosted an acting workshop that gave students at the community college a chance to perform scenes from the play and its sequel, Clyburn Park. Students were led by New Venture's artistic director, Greg Williams, a native of Baton Rouge, and professional actor Roger Ferrier, who grew up in Lacombe. Jacqueline Jones was familiar with A Raisin in the Sun long before she auditioned for her role. Jones believes her character, the mother, Lena, remains relevant today and has much to teach young people facing obstacles on account of the colour of their skin. It's a part of history. It's not to be accepted, but to understand it when you are confronted with it. But the play gives you an opportunity to know how to confront it, not with anger, um, but look within oneself and in the family for strength. The strength of Lena, the mother in the story, it just exemplifies what in most persons in my day thought of black women. She knows that she's the head of the house or she feels that she is, but she is willing to transcend that power to her son. And I hope that in today's time, young people can see that doors are opening for women, but let us not forget the role we play. Let the male rise, let him lead. You know, we're strong, you know that. You don't have to 
show the world, to up show him. Even some of the younger actors were very familiar with Hansbury's work, so it was a treat for them to have their own opportunity to perform lines from the play. To me, she's almost like Jackie Robinson, in the sense of Jackie Robinson was so great to where there's a certain day in the baseball season where everybody wears her number. As far as Lorraine Hansberry, every high school is required to read her play, Raising in the Sun. So to do something that amazing in this country, you gotta give it to her. Well, in some ways, I see myself a lot as Walter, because in the play, Walter's a dreamer. Walter is a person that's willing to do whatever it takes to fulfill his dream. So I can see my way, way in so many different occasions in my life. So when I'm playing him, it's almost like I'm playing myself in a sense. So it's really natural. I started to learn more um, as I took this class and was um, getting into casting for the role of Benita. Um, I think it's a phenomenal story. I think Lorraine Hansberry is just a phenomenal woman as far as writing things that are um, transitional for the African American community and also the activist that she was. Um, it's a good thing to learn about it because a lot of people don't hear about her story and don't know what a raisin in the sun means to the African American community. They don't know what redlining is and they don't know what type of impact that that had at that point in time in the world and they don't know the impact that it still has today in the world. Getting younger generation to understand the, the artwork behind plays and dramas and things like that is important because it speaks to the imagination in all of us. It speaks to the creativity in all of us. And it speaks to the sympathy and the empathy that we can have for one another as human beings on this planet. The mama in The Raisin in the Sun wasn't looking at oh, if we move over there, there's going to be trouble because that's a white neighborhood. She was looking at the fact that I found a house that was cheap enough for us to afford so we could take care of ourselves. She didn't care who lived in that neighborhood. She was looking out for her family and making sure they're taken care of. And I think that just paved the way for seeing different things like the Cosby Show. That was just a family that could have been any family, but it was a black family and it was a successful black family. You know, that was something that was never seen on TV before. And the, what she wrote was something that was real and it was just us and breaking out who we were and the struggles that we're dealing with as just normal everyday family. Kind of that same thing, but it was just more earlier on and in our phase of play. I think it's incredibly important to know who Lorraine Hansberry is. First of all, she introduced us to the world of black theater, as I like to call it, theater of the black experience. And I think she introduced us to the black family. Um, prior to A Raisin in the Sun, you only saw black characters in the domestic realms of their pos positions and jobs. And this was the first time we saw them at home as husband, wife, mother, child, uh, family. And it became an American drama as opposed to us kind of being on the foreground of the landscape of another story. Her ability as a playwright to take four main characters and have one dream to be to start a business, even if it was a liquor store. One's dream is to be a doctor. One character's dream is to buy a home for her family. And another one's dream is to keep her family together. The ability to showcase African Americans and their desires and their ability to want something bigger than themselves it's the first time we saw that. It was the first time we really saw, we want things too. And that is really what the play is about, is showcasing the humanity of those characters. And today is just as important because we're now starting to see a whole new movement where you know, there's a generation even under me that are making things happen that I wouldn't even dream possible. Well, I think it's a, a tremendous opportunity for our students to connect with our community and to really to connect with industry professionals as well and understand what it's going to take to transfer if they should choose to go into theater. Hundreds of people turned out to watch the American Masters documentary on a big screen at Baton Rouge Community College's Magnolia Performing Arts Pavilion.
Afterward, New Ventures Artistic Director Greg Williams, BRCC Theatre Professor Dr Tony Medlin and English Professor Bea Gima took part in a panel discussion about the documentary and Hansbury's ongoing relevance today. Lorraine Hansbury's work and the importance of that moment is something that we can capture hear and explain to them through the panel, through them doing some work, scene work, um, and with directors who understand how to interpret that for our students. And, and, and I think it's really important too that we pause and we listen to our students' um, voice. If you're looking for opportunities to get into the visual and performing arts, Louisiana never lets you down. So here's a list of some of the festivals, concerts and exhibits headed your way in the weeks to come. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, pick up a copy of Country Roads magazine. Another resource, the Art Rocks website features every episode of the program, so just log on to lpb.org and follow the prompts. What's going on in Reno, Nevada? Hot stuff if Nicole Seaton has anything to do with it. An accomplished flame worker, Seaton uses a gas flame to work distinctive Java flame items of jewellery and sculpture from glass. Seaton breaks down how she found her feet in the rarefied field of glass blowing. My name is Nicole Seaton and I'm a glass blower and a lamp worker. Everything that I make is under five inches, so you can fit uh, my pieces in the palm of your hand, mostly jewelry. And I work mostly with solid glass rod, so the, the technical name for, for that kind of art is lamp working. It's not very well known outside of the glass blowing, lamp working world, so uh, I tend to say I'm a glass blower or a flame worker. All the movements in what I do in lamp working and glass blowing are very soft, very gradual. There's no um, like really hard, you know, um, huffing and puffing and blowing the house down. None of that's really soft. You're blowing air into a tube, so you're actually blowing air to form the glass. And I use a mixture of oxygen and propane to melt the glass. The flame comes from the oxygen and the propane mixing. It's a dual mixed torch, so these two gases mix and I light them and that creates a strong enough flame to melt the glass. I don't go by an exact temperature to get the glass to melt. I go by color, and that color is somewhere between sherbet and hot pink, and that's what I'm, that's right when the glass is molten, and when I can take it out of the flame and, and form it, change it, stretch it, just for a few seconds before putting it back in the flame. I use glass tubes, I use glass rods, clear glass, and a glass that comes in every different color of the rainbow, and more. The glass has different metal components or uh, composition in it. Some of the glass is called striking glass, and that means it'll change colors um, when, when you mix it with fire. Even I don't know what's gonna happen a lot of times. There's a great amount of alchemy that is involved with glass blowing. For example, I use a lot of sterling silver. I flick off little flakes of sterling silver from a coin and Silver on the outside of glass turns gold. What got me into uh, lamp working and glass blowing is I wanted to create the centerpieces for my designs, and that's turned into over time um, designing 
pieces, centerpieces for other, for other artists to integrate into their designs, and that's mostly what I do now. I'm really happy with what I'm doing. I don't want to switch mediums too much. Art to me is adherence to a form, and that means doing the same thing over and over and over again, till one day you say, I think that's what I was after, and that's an exciting day. With a lifetime of community art support to guide her, Sacramento, California artist Marcy Friedman has made an eye-catching return to the world of life drawing. Here's her story. Everything about my life is art-related. I do see everything through probably a bit of a studied lens now. It wasn't that way 30, 40 years ago. I didn't used to tell people that I was an artist. And I will tell you, it was a big surprise, but I think they're getting used to it now. My passion for life drawing had come from my college years at Stanford when I had taken life drawing classes and pretty much gave it up to be a, a mom, a wife. During that period of time, I got involved with the Crocker Art Museum and much of my energy, all my energies went into those three areas. What I found was um, when you're undergoing something that's stressful in your life, um, there is a bit of a therapeutic quality to art. It forces you to set aside the part of your brain that focuses on something painful and brings you into a realm where uh, you can develop new ideas. About five years ago, it was pretty clear that my husband Mort was suffering from a degenerative disease and it was weighing heavily on, um, on me watching this slow progression of the illness. And I knew I needed something and kind of in the back of my mind for a year or two I had been thinking, you know, maybe this is time to go back to the solace. The art form itself, the function of creativity, I think it puts you in another zone. I think my art has become quite a bit stronger. I have really been focusing on looking more accurately at what I'm seeing. Can't walk the park or the block without seeing things differently. You know, if I'm in the park, I can see the changing seasons and the colors and, you know, and in my head, I'm not just looking at orange, I'm looking at cadmium red orange. As we change, our tastes evolve, they change. You get you know, introduced to something entirely new or different, whether it's been the development of the new Crocker, collecting, and these associations with the arts community. We are all much more alike than we are different, and art tends to bring that out in individuals. You can see that whatever walk of life you are, this appreciation for beauty is common, and I think that's what drives me. My goal as an artist, I guess recognition in some way. I'm not willing to stay at the same level. I just have this inner drive that every painting I do has to be better than the last one. Back home for our Louisiana Treasures segment, just in time to do a little wine sampling up in the hill country of West Monroe. That's where Jeff Landry and his wife Libby settled after Hurricane Katrina blew them 
and their winery, Landry Vineyards, out of St Tammany Parish. I had a love for agriculture because my grandparents were farmers in Point Capi Parish and I grew up going to the country during the summers and got exposure to agriculture there. I wanted to be a farmer and uh, my parents said, no, you don't want to be a farmer, you'll be poor. And uh, so I listened to my parents and I went to industrial instrumentation school in Baton Rouge and, and actually ended up doing control systems engineering for 25 years and so that was my career and I loved what I did, but I had a, a passion for agriculture and we had four boys. And we were looking for something we could do with 20 acres of land in Folsom, Louisiana, and uh, looked at different agricultural type businesses, but we were looking for something that you could really add value to a product. In other words, take the agricultural product and add value to it and stability, and then sell a significant portion direct to the consumer. So that was the model that we were looking for, and we ran across a winery in our area, Punch a Train Vineyards, and discovered, wow, you can grow grapes in Louisiana. Wine grapes said that. So we investigated and did some studying and decided to plant two acres of grapes. It takes three years to produce a crop. In the third year, Punch a Train Vineyards was going to buy our grapes, but they weren't able to. And as a result, we ended up in the wine business. We had 10 tons of grapes hanging in the field no market to sell the grapes to, and another winery, Amato's Winery in Hammond, Louisiana, worked with us, we made the wine at his winery, and we were licensed in 2002. We continue to make wine there in Folsom until 2006. Well, uh, 2005, Hurricane Katrina devastated our area, and you know it really disconnected us, if you will, from, the, from home. We looked to North Louisiana because we had evacuated here several times before, and my brother was here. And as we researched growing conditions here, found that it was a decreased precipitation area. And then we found these beautiful hills in West Monroe, Louisiana, very sandy and very suitable for growing grapes here. And so we really got excited about it and said, well, we'll start to make a move in that direction. The rest is history. We have really enjoyed this community and we believe that the community has enjoyed us also. We had a home on the property and we started planting grapes immediately. We erected a, a winery, a building. We moved our tanks in and we began production here. We continued to produce the grapes in Folsom and we started doing some of the things we were already doing like we were making a blueberry Merlot wine, and we were also buying some grapes from California also. And so we've just, over the years, added more wines, added more grapes here on the property. Now we're on a 50-acre property. This started off as 20 acres. We purchased 30 acres across the street. We have a total of 15 acres here planted. Our production here at Landry Vineyards is approximately 30,000 gallons of wine. Um, approximately 150,000 bottles, which is about 13,000 cases of wine. We are not solely dependent on what we grow. We grow a grape called Blanc du Bois. It's a wine grape, Lenoir, and then we also grow some Muscadines. And recently we added a new grape, Crimson Cabernet, a cross between Cabernet Sauvignon and Norton, uh, which we're very optimistic about, especially with its parentage having Cabernet Sauvignon in it, which is the number one grape in the world even. We also bring in grapes from out of state, from California and even recently Washington State, premium grapes that make high quality wines. We make what we call uh, cultural wines, which is everything from peach wine, peach muscadine wine, muscadine wines, blackberry merlot, people love blackberries here in Louisiana, blueberry merlot, which is a blend of blueberry wine and merlot. Blueberries grow well in Louisiana. So we're growing what we call cultural wines, but we also have a line of really high quality French style wines that we produce here at Landry Vineyards. And then the first step in the process when we bring the grapes to the winery is to de-stem and crush the grapes. Then if it's a white wine, we, we, we press the wine, press the grapes, um, and then the juice is collected and just the juice is fermented. If it's a red wine, it's actually fermented on the skins. So it's de-stemmed, crushed, and then fermented on the skin. So you have the pulp, the juice, the seeds, and the, the juice and everything is all together. And that ferments, dr taking, removing all of the good stuff during the alcohol fermentation, it's drawn from the skins. 
Uh, so that's what gives it the color and lots of flavor. From there, it's still pressed, the red grapes are pressed, brought into the tank. And then after the fermentation is complete, it depends on the style of the wine. If it's a fruit forward wine, it'll stay in the stainless steel tank. If it's gonna be a fruit forward but yet barrel aged wine, of course it goes into barrels. We obtain more complexity from aging in the barrels. And we do approximately 30% of our production goes into barrel aging. We are in approximately 500 different stores throughout Louisiana. Republic National Beverage is our distributor. Uh, we sell about 30% right here at the winery and at arts and craft shows and farmers markets and whatnot around the state of Louisiana. We love the response that the people have from coming and seeing the vineyards. We do concerts and everything out here and it's a great time. And we also have a tasting room here where we sell the wines. And that's going to do it for this edition of Art Rocks. But remember, you can always watch episodes of the show at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you can't get enough culture, Country Roads magazine makes a great resource for finding out what's going on in the arts all across the state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thank you for watching.